I'm going to start to talk to you today about is the actual carrying out of an SQRA. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through some common risk terms using the SQRA process, explain the general framework that we use, and also some of the limitations associated with an SQRA. So let's start with some definitions and terminology. So risk is a, it's a three-legged stool. That's the way I like to think of it. One doesn't exist without one. It can't stand without all three legs. Um, so that first leg is hazards, um, floods, uh, earthquakes, and how likely they are to occur. Second is performance. So once that structure is loaded, how is it going to perform? Um, and the third is consequences. So what's in harm's way? How susceptible to harm are they? How much harm is caused? Like Nate said earlier, um, our guiding light on this is life safety. But we also consider economic consequences. We consider environmental consequences. Um, but most of our decision making is based on life safety. So here's the general risk equation. So it's, it's just a product of those three things. The likelihood of a structure being loaded, again, by flood, by earthquake. Um, the adverse structural performance, given the load occurs, times the magnitude of the resulting consequences. So it can be boiled down to one number. We usually call the annualized um, life loss estimate, but you know, not super useful in general communication and communicating in normal English terms. So there's a lot to this, um, but this is a good basic building block right here. Okay, so when we boil that down, uh, those risk estimates down, we try to communicate them on a matrix. This is sometimes referred to as a FN chart or a life safety matrix. So here on the x-axis, we have uh, life loss. So that's, again, that's how we primarily base our decision-making is on life loss. But there can also be um, economic damages here too. Um, and then here on the y-axis, this is the probability of failure. So that's the product of the likelihood of the flood occurring or the earthquake and the structural performance. So how likely is it to, uh, to fail versus the consequences of it failing? And so when we do a risk assessment, we get a point on this graph, you know, over here, over here, over here, over here. Um, and so these lines right here are called the tollable risk guidelines and where the point tells us a lot. So up here in this red zone, that's bad. So high consequences, or excuse me, high likelihood of failure and high consequences is in this zone. Lower likelihood of failure and lower consequences, good. Sometimes we have these risks that are still low likelihood of failure, but very high consequences, and those have their own special category because society is generally not tolerable of, of large life loss. So we want to be aware of that. We want to act accordingly. Um, risks that lie in this area are honestly hard to buy down because they're typically going to be really expensive to modify a structure uh, because they're, they're big structures usually, and they're upstream of large major cities, and they're already a low likelihood of, likelihood of failure. So this is the ALARB zone, as low as reasonably practicable. So we try to reduce risks as responsibly as we can for, the, for what, what, we can, what, what expenditures, expenditures we can justify doing that. Um, so risks within a range that society can live with to secure the benefits provided by the dam or the levy. Those should be comparable. That's this kind of theory of, or this, this concept of tolerability. So com some components of flood risk. So we split risk up into a couple of different ways. Um, incremental, non-breach, and residual. So incremental risk, or what we sometimes call dam or levee risk, it's the likelihood of something going bad. So it's the breach prior to overtopping, um, like internal erosion or slope instability or something like that. Uh, component malfunction and proper operation or overtopping with breach. So again, this is the this is the the risk associated with the the structure not performing how we designed it to do it. Non breach risk. So this is spillway flow through, through a dam um, without breach, overtopping of a levee without breach or dam, or interior drainage capacity of the levee area exceeded. So this is the risk associated with the structure operating how we've designed it. You know, it's gone into a major flood's occurring. It's gone into passing the flood. And so there's still risk associated with it, but it's still design, uh, performing how we've designed it. So the sum of these two things is what we call residual or flood risk. 
This is the risk that the people who live downstream, that's the only risk they care about. This right here is what we regulate to. So this is what we're trying to reduce. We can't do much here. This is actually what we've designed the structures to do. But this is what we're trying to wrap our heads around so we can reduce the risk to the structures as much as we can, or excuse me, risk to the people downstream as much as we can. This slide kind of repeats that a little bit. Um, dam and levy risk is po risk posed by the potential poor performance of a dam or levy, also known as incremental risk associated with the breach of a dam or levy. And then flood risk includes dam and levy risk as well as the risk of flooding from capacity of exceedance or the dam or levy. So it's the flood risk is the one that the people downstream care about. Dam and levy risk, that's the one we're focused on reducing. Um, tolerable risk concepts and decisions for dam and levy safety are based on dam and levy risk because that's where we're aiming to uh, reduce that risk. And background risk or flood risk is assumed to include that risk associated with the proper performance of dam and levy. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about what this incremental concept is. So we're going to look at that in the context of consequences here. Um, so this is sort of a graphic right here showing a large flood has kind of come in and it's we have we're, we're moving water through our spillway and we have some inundation area which is kind of demonstrated by this green and so you know that's again performing how that's 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 the dam performing how it's supposed to perform and so we've got some sort of flood going on we've got an inundation area then we have a breach and that that inundation area downstream gets larger so the incremental is the difference between those two. It's the cross-hatched area. That's the increase beyond what the dam is designed to do associated with breach. That's what we're concerned with, and that's what we're trying to regulate against, is the incremental consequences. Let me skip that for a second. So what is a risk assessment? Um, in its most basic form, it's a thought experiment. We put a bunch of guys, smart guys in a room, and we ask them to get familiar with the dam or the levee and try to um, come up with all the ways that they think they can fail. And then they kind of um, go through that list and say, which are, the, which are the big, most important ones that's gonna really drive the risk here? And then they try to figure out how likely those things are to occur. And then they associate, or they estimate the consequences associated with each of those failure modes. Um, if, the, if those if those failure modes do occur. So we're, we're estimating the likelihood of failure. We're, we're, estimate, we're, we're trying to figure out what are the risk driving failure modes. We're estimating the likelihood of those and the consequences of those failure modes. That's a risk assessment. That's really all we're doing here. And then we make decisions about whether to reduce the risk and how to reduce the risk based on that information. So meteor strike is not actually a failure mode that we consider on dams. You shouldn't do that either. Um, so what is a potential failure mode? So it's a structured way to describe a chain of events that leads to failure. So here we have a pretty typical uh, levy. Um, water is always to the left. The failure always goes left to right, right? Um, so this is overtopping. So, so this is a list of potential failure modes. It is not a complete list. This is uh, a popular, a sort of a greatest, hit, greatest hits list. Um, so it could be more out there, but here's, here's a few overtopping. Um, so basically we would say and breach for most of these failure modes because we're interested in actual um, re uncontrolled release of water downstream. That's our definition of failure. Burke's definition is slightly different and um, they're concerned with some more things because uh, they're dealing with dam owners who, um, well, let's not get too complicated first. So overtopping and breach. Uh, overtopping with jetting, which is kind of like a wave overwash type of uh, failure mode. Internal erosion or piping, this right here looks like internal erosion through the embankment. Surface erosion, so water flowing by actually erodes the, uh, the water side of, of the uh, of the levee slope. It could actually tie into internal erosion because it makes it more susceptible to internal erosion. Uh, sliding, so the levee actually slides. Wave impacts, we start to damage the, uh, the water side of the levee. Uh, structural impacts, maybe not such a big deal for levees, but maybe a really big deal for flood walls. Um, liquefaction during an earthquake, or there could even be static liquefaction, depending on what kind of uh, a dam or levee you're dealing with, usually strikes uh, more poorly compacted embankments. Um, 
piping of the substratum. So this is what we call this internal erosion through the foundation. You can see this is sort of a sandy layer right through here. Tree damage. So this would this tree would fall, and this could encourage uh, internal erosion. This is actually one of the failure modes that happened during Hurricane Katrina over on London Canal. Or slope instability. Uh, particularly sensitive to levees are particularly sensitive to that immediately after they're constructed. Something to be considered with. So let's talk a little bit about the approach to an SQRA. So there's basically uh, some key steps that you want to, to that kind of um, lays out a risk assessment from start to finish. So you want to start with scoping it, identify the nature of the required decision, and you want to think about how to scale um, the level of effort to the decision that you want to make. Is this an easy decision that we can do quickly with a screening level analysis, or is it going to be really difficult and we need to do something more like a quantitative risk assessment? Um, Determine roles and responsibilities. You know, we're going to talk more about that later today. Facilitators, there's going to be a geotag, there's going to be a structural geologist. And then we start to plan it. So we develop a schedule, we develop a budget, and we actually start to pick the individual people. Um, and then we actually do the assessment. So this is where the, all the, uh, the, a lot of the nuts and bolts go down. Uh, you prepare for the risk assessment by reviewing, you know, um, whatever data you have available to you. Um, generating your uh, your loads your, or what your expected loads are and their frequencies of those loads, your consequences. Then you identify and assess the risk. We're going to talk more about that um, after the break, and that's where a lot of the interesting parts happen. And once you get through the risk and you have a calculation of the risk, you propose a decision. What are you going to do based on the risk? Next, you go into review. So peer review results for consisti consistency, accuracy, uh, review the proposed decision, and then the decision goes to um, our senior folks. They choose a path forward, allow for reconsideration and multiple decision paths to ensure a shared decision is achieved. Shared because we are, we are partners in this process. Uh, for us, it's levy spons sponsors. Uh, for FERC, it's, levy it's dam owners. So what is a semi-quantitative risk analysis. So in SQRA, it's a process to evaluate the significance of potential failure modes from a risk perspective. Um, so they, these are, this is like a tear sheet from the potential failure mode analysis uh, process, where we're basically um, brainstorming everything that we think can go wrong with the dam, spillway erosion, back erosion piping at the foundation, BP in the left abutment, internal erosion along the conduit, into the conduit, blah, 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 blah. Um, and we're going through and we're picking which ones are the most likely. So looks like uh, left service gate failure is not that big of an issue over here. Neither is BP, BEP um, or this internal erosion. But it's like BEP in the foundation might be a consideration. So they're, they're, they're considering that to be a, a big enough risk that they'll want to look at it in greater detail. So this is something they're going to assess risk on. So this is that PFMA process. We're eliciting failure modes and we're picking which ones we're going to spend our time on. So it's a, an SQRA, it's a risk categorization, categorization system that assigns a likelihood and consonance, consequence categories to those risk driving potential failure modes based on existing data. At the end of the risk assessment, each one of these risk driving failure modes is going to be plotted on one of these risk matrices. So this is one somebody actually is doing in the room during the week of the elicitation. Put some post-it notes, PFM1 overtopping, looks like it's low to remote with level one consequences. So that's just kind of an initial exposure. We're going to talk a lot more about that today. So why semi-quantitative uh, semi risk assessment? So we used to make some of the easier decisions. So again, this is sort of the middle road for us. It's more intensive than a screening. It's not as intensive as a quantitative risk assessment or a QRA. Um, so it's a little bit easier to do for us. Um, in situations where it's desired to apply risk analysis principles to the decision making without the time, cost, data analysis requirements associated with the more detailed costly approaches like a QRA. Um, as a quick evaluation of the risks using only existing data so the risk reduction studies and actions can be prioritized. We're not going to go out and do a bunch of borings. We want to keep this fast and light. We probably hopefully have a wealth of data that we can use at our fingertips. So we want to scavenge every single bit of that we can and read it. That's cheap free data. So we want to take advantage of that as much as we can. You know, if you want to do a quick stability analysis or a seepage analysis, it's going to take you not very long to inform your judgment on that. Maybe that's on the table. 
but that's going to be about the limit of it. Um, as a high-level screening to determine the potential failure modes that should be carried forward for a quantitative, a, um, a more detailed analysis, which can help to reduce uncertainty in that decision if that's what the risk assessment points you at. So here's an overview of the whole SQA process. I talked about that PFMA piece a bit, the potential failure mode analysis. That is a step in an SQRA. So the PFMA, that's the part where we brainstorm potential failure modes and we categorize them as risk drivers or non-risk drivers so that we can decide what we're going to focus our efforts in the SQRA on. So we are actually assessing the risk, discuss, evaluate, classify the risk for risk drivers. And then we just, based on that results of that, we're thinking about what are we going to do? Discuss the recommendations for additional instrumentation, monitoring, risk reduction, data analysis. You know, are we going to get more data and study it harder? We're going to do nothing because the risk is cool. Or are we going to actually recommend that we go out there and we get out the big toys and start making structural modifications to the dam or levy to reduce the risk? Those are the decisions that can come out of a risk assessment. Okay, let's talk about some of the limitations. Got a 35, right? Um, so it only provides an order of magnitude estimate for failure likelihood and consequences. So it's not an explicit um, estimate of the uncertainty. We're kind of, you know, looks about right there. You know, it's an order of magnitude estimate. Um, so it doesn't provide the full range of uncertainty. When we're doing a quantitative risk assessment, we're putting together event trees and we're providing estimates for uh, the likelihood of each one of those nodes in an event tree, then we can sort of um, choose the best value, but also a likely high value and a likely low value. If you do that for, for each one, then we're catching the, uh, the extent of the uncertainty of that particular failure mode. So we can do that in a QRA. We don't do that in a PFMA. Again, light, fast. We're trying to get a decision relatively quick and for a reasonable amount of money. Um, may not be able to confirm dam or levy ish safety issues with adequate confidence. We're using the existing data that we have available to us. You know, one of the things that can come out of a risk assessment is we can see where our weaknesses are. We can say, you know, this abutment over here looks really suspicious. We don't have any borings over there. If we went over there and got a couple of borings, that could really improve our knowledge and reduce our uncertainty and increase our confidence. Um, we can't tell those things a lot of times without a risk assessment. Further analysis efforts should be considered when there's a lack of confidence and the ability to make a decision regarding whether to take action or reduce risk. Yeah. Um, so this is a slide depicting the difference between this SQRA and this QRA thing. So SQRA, the magnitude estimate, nope. um, you know, we're, we're, we're plotting a box, we're not necessarily a point. So we're putting a box on a plot, that's something Everybody likes to say so, and it makes a lot of sense. But with the QRA, we are we're we're, we're estimating the best estimate of, of risk, which is what these these points are right here. But we're also um, estimating the likelihood of uncertainty, and that's what these boxes are here. So you can see that, you know, we're just doing a basic box over here. But sometimes, you know, the uncertainty doesn't have to stick stick to a box. Sometimes it's smaller. Oftentimes it is larger. I've seen some of these uncertainties range, you know, two orders of magnitude sometimes, but it's, we rarely do the boxes anymore. It's more like a, uh, a shotgun blast, but anyways. Um, so that's kind of the, the difference in the results of an SQRA and a QRA. All right, so we have a learning check. All right, we will go ahead and get started with question number one. Risk is a product of the one probability of the load on the structure, two probability of perfor poor performance given the load, and three consequences resulting from the poor performance given the load. That was a true or false question, and 95% of you um, answered correctly with true. Question number two is also true or false. Non-breach consequences from normal operational releases are subtracted from breach consequences from failure of the structure or component to get the incremental consequences used in the risk equation. We've got a couple last people still answering, but there's 71% of you so far that have answered correctly with true.
Question number three is true or false. Tolerability of risk is evaluated based on the dam and levy risk or incremental risk. I'm going to give it 10 seconds. We've still got a couple of folks answering. 91% of you have this correct with true. Moving on to question four, which level of risk assessment can be used as a high level screening to determine which potential failure modes should be carried forward for further analysis? And this answer, um, folks are still responding, a little bit of a mix, but so far we've got about 60% that have answered correctly with A, SQRA. And moving on to question number five, which of the following is a limitation associated with the SQRA approach? Got a couple answers. A, it only provides order of magnitude estimates for failure likelihood and consequences. B, it doesn't provide the full range of uncertainty. C, it may not be able to confirm dam and levy safety issues with adequate, adequate confidence. And the final answer, which 100% of you voted, is D, all of the above. Okay, great. Um, so I don't know if you noticed, but I kind of talk fast through that. So if anybody has any questions, um, we've got some time for that. So you talk a lot about um, like coming up with these hazards and uh, you know sitting in a room and imagining bad things that could happen to like a levee or a dam. Um, and I know it's actually relatively recent that this has, you know, been a method of analysis people have engaged in. Have you had a scenario where a dam has failed and you've done a risk assessment and it was just sort of like, well, we didn't think of that? Or have you had a scenario conversely where you caught something that, you know, prevented a dam from failing? Uh, I just, when I read about or, or you know, and listen to engineering disasters, often the disaster occurs in a way that was unanticipated. So that would be a concern of like not thinking of the failure and then having it fail, you know, without even doing any assessment at all of that particular method of failure. So a lot of, a lot of things wrapped up in that question. I'm gonna try to address some of those things. Um, so your point about things failing in a, in a way that's not been anticipated before. So. I think a lot of times that's when you're using standards-based engineering, which basically you're designing for loads. You're not thinking about, a, you're not coming at it from another direction where you're like, okay, this thing is loaded. Now I'm trying to think of every single way that it fails. So I think risk assessment um, really attunes itself to trying to find those unusual failure modes. And we're going to talk more about that. You know, it's not a perfect concept, but I think it's better. Um, so with regard to have we done a risk assessment on something that has failed and, um, you know, recently, I think it's um, Arca Butler was starting to have some distress just within the last couple of months, Arca Butler Dam. And um, it started to show distress uh, within a failure mode that we didn't exactly define with the way that it was manifesting itself, but it maybe was initiating or maybe starting to progress a little bit in line with one of our risk driving failure modes. So success there. But, you know, um, let's see, there was another piece of your question here that I wanted to, yeah. oh, you weren't always learning. Um, so the, uh, the Michigan dams that failed about three years ago from static liquefaction, Edenville Dam, thank you. So that's not one that's really been, which is static liquefaction is what that failed on. And that's not really been one that's like, that's not come up in a lot of risk assessments. So, um, that strikes usually dams that maybe weren't um, constructed using modern construction practices. So I think that within the core library, at least, uh, or portfolio, um, it's not going to be more a, a, one of the more significant failure modes, but it's something that we should be aware of. So we're starting to work it into our best practices. So, I mean, we're not perfect. We're trying the best that we can. We're trying to continue to develop our engineering judgment and stay abreast of these issues um, to learn and get better develop that subject matter expertise, uh, but really good question. I mean, it's a journey, you know what I'm saying? It's, you just want to keep on moving towards it. There's no, okay, we're done. So good, great question. Any other questions? I think this is working. I, I'm curious about um, 
you're using incre incremental consequence um, in the analysis. I'm curious, it seems like the magnitude of the incremental consequence might be related to um, certain assumptions you make about the failure. Are you always assuming catastrophic failures? How do you decide your increment kind of and incremental uh, consequences? So good question. Um, so you want to you want to find you want to consider that. So let's say that we have an embankment that fails, uh, but it has a dike over to the side. So if that dike fails and it's only twenty feet high, you know the, the breach is going to be much smaller. The inundation area is going to be much smaller. The incremental consequences would be much smaller. But if it fails at the valley section, then it's going to be a much larger uh, uh, breach. There's going to be a lot more inundation. We're going to have full release of the pool. So that's something that we consider for each failure mode and for each load level for each failure mode. So um, you really got to kind of flush out the details for each one of those. Yeah, Garrett. Mm -hmm. uh, here he comes. Jonathan's coming over to him. Yeah, so my question is about the FN chart with the tolerable risk guidelines. Um, like, it's kind of a two-part question. What goes into setting the diagonal? And then is it a policy decision to just cut that box out in the lower right-hand corner at e to the minus 6 and 1,000 life loss? Like, why doesn't that diagonal line just keep going? Because So we are, I think we're going to talk about in the next presentation. Okay. Um, but uh, it's... Historical risk assessment and um, agencies that have done risk assessment have kind of led the way on a lot of these things and why this is, you know, diagonal and not horizontal or up and down, as well as this box over here. So okay. I'm going to leave it to the actual presentations so that I don't screw anything up. Um, yeah, we could talk for hours about that. But why is that a one-to-one -one slope for, for us in the United States or it's other countries that look at that differently, different slope? Different folks truncate things in that lower right hand corner differently on that. So a lot of different ways to be able to look at that and, and why people do that. And so like I said, we could talk for hours about that. Um, I, I believe this is a small FN, should be a small FN curve, not the exceedance probability. And the first one that we had uh, should have been the cumulative, should have been the uh, exceedance probability. That was the one that you showed at the beginning. Just, just for clarification. Um, just, just real quick, and that, that's a risk matrix. It's not even an FN chart. So right. I, that's not an FN chart over on the left-hand side. That's that's just from an SQRA. Mm -hmm. That's a risk matrix. Yeah, the risk it, it mimics an FN chart, yeah. but it's not an FN chart. It would be a, it, it would be a small FN. It wouldn't be the exceedance probability. It would just be the probability of that event uh, yeah. would have that consequence. Yeah. But in any case. It's uh, just uh, different. Yeah. I, I was a little confused on the uh, description of the incremental consequence. Somebody else had, had mentioned this too. Um, I thought the incremental was as if, you know, the extra that you would have it uh, over and above what it would be without the dam or the or the letter. Mm -hmm. so, so as opposed to you know your your expected flow. Uh, you know, that, that you're passing through. I think that's more of a, um, that's when you're in a decision about whether to, you know, build a structure or not build a structure when you're starting to look at the risks with and without the dam. So um, this risk assessment, you know, SQRAs, et cetera, et cetera, really to look at existing structures and the condition of those. So when you're talking about a feasibility study to examine, you know, um, whether it's a good idea to build a structure or not build a structure, you know, you're really in a, um, oh, help me out here. Uh, benefit cost um, comparison there. So, you know, then you're looking at, you know, the costs that it would take to build the dam versus, you know, how much uh, cost you're going to save by reducing the risk. So it's a little bit different equation. So, with regard to incremental consequences and looking at existing structures and whether or not to improve those, that we're looking at the difference between non breach and breach. So, a different equation when we're talking about um, a structure there or not there. But in terms of the, uh, shall we say, the guidance, you know, your FN curve, is that, you know, is the incremental as defined here, or yeah. is it uh, with 
the breach, I mean, with a dam breach, as opposed to no dam being there, like on a flood. So it would be, uh, it would be incremental, like what we're talking about here, because we're trying to compare the risk from one structure to another. And we're looking at our existing portfolio.